Okay, let's get started. Welcome everybody to today's webinar on using contact-free liquid dispensing for high throughput COVID qPCR assays. My name is Anita and I'm the head of outreach here at protocols.io and we're really excited to host today's webinar together in partnership with Formulatrix. And before we get started, I just want to go over a couple logistical notes. First, um, we are recording this webinar. Um, and if you have registered for this webinar, we will be sending you the recording shortly afterwards. Also, at the end of the session today, we have reserved some time for audience Q&A. If you do have any questions for our speakers today, please feel free to add them to the Q&A section here on Zoom throughout the entire session, and we have time to get to them at the end. Um, if you go to the bottom of your Zoom interface, you'll see a button that says Q&A and it has two little speech bubbles. If you click on that, that's the place to put your questions. And yeah, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Dan Lord now, who will give us an introduction to Formulatrix. Thank you, Anita. Um, so, just as a quick introduction to the people who aren't familiar with Formulatrix. We were founded in 2002 and have grown rapidly to be the market leader in protein crystallography. And we're establishing ourselves as an innovative force in the field of liquid handling. In the last 18 years, we've grown from just two people to over 700 globally and have more than 1000 liquid handling instruments installed worldwide. We've spoken with hundreds of scientists to understand from them what is important in liquid handling systems. Time and time again, these six points come up. Systems should be reproducible and precise to guarantee that the results you get are right first time. Systems need to be fast and automated to get those results as quickly as possible with minimal hands-on time. This is especially important right now as we assist many end users globally in their work to test for and research into COVID-19. They need to be flexible and simple to use, even for people without experience of robotics and automation, so that laboratories can scale up quickly without disrupting established workflows. The Mantis and Tempest are our low volume non-contact dispensers, capable of dispensing multiple reagents down to volumes as low as 100 nanoliters with high accuracy and precision. Within the realms of what we're discussing today, the Mantis and Tempest have some powerful benefits that complement traditional liquid handling systems. The ability to miniaturize assays and reduce dependency on plastic consumables, such as pipette tips, ensures continuity when these resources are hard to come by. Automation of development steps means that protocols can be given lots of minor tweaks for major impacts in a reproducible and scalable way. And the simple software empowers users making automation accessible without the need for dedicated engineers and steep learning curves. The growing consensus within the field seems to be that to have the greatest impact in COVID-19 screening, it's vital to enable smaller, more agile laboratories to push ahead and supplement the big centralized laboratories. Whether this is as an independent lab providing a service to a national screening campaign mobile laboratories that can be located in hotspot areas at short notice, or institutes and organizations providing their own in-house screening services to ensure the safety of their people and minimizing disruption to work. The demands of big centralized laboratories on the screening supply chain have been immense, and we're glad that we can assist by delivering automation with a fast turnaround time and relieving pressure on labs by reducing their dependence on highly sought after consumables and reagents. And I'd like to hand over now to Dr. Neil Ashley, who will be sharing his experience of the Mantis at their laboratory in Oxford in the UK. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, thank you to everyone uh, who's logged in. Uh, let me just get up my talk. Okay. Okay, so um, I thought I'd start by uh, just 
uh, outlining my understanding of um, the current uh, state of the art of COVID testing um, in two settings. One would be a, cl a typical clinical workflow and, uh, and a high throughput workflow. So this slide shows the um, a typical clinical COVID testing pipeline. So we start off with uh, a swab from the patient, uh, which goes into a, a, CL, a CL3 clean room. And uh, generally it's manually transferred into screw, screw cap tubes. Uh, and then it goes on to typically a, a Kyogen type um, robotic system. Kyogen Symphony is very popular. Uh, so these are robot systems which uh, automate the whole process of RNA extraction from the swabs. And then the throughput is uh, the RNA, the purified RNA is then distributed into uh, tubes. And then depending on the sophistication of the, the lab in question, there might be another robot, a smaller robot, which then does sets of qPCR. Uh, uh, or in, in a lot of clinical labs, I think it's still manually done. Uh, and then it's run on a, on a qPCR machine and then fed into a, a limb system. So that's, uh, that's, that's a typical um, clinical approach. Obviously, now we're in a pandemic situation. So we've now seen the development of very high throughput labs. So these would be, for example, in the UK, they're called the Lighthouse Labs. And these are large mega labs and they have a lot of automation in them. They still have the same problem of uh, isolating the RNA from the swab, which is a very arduous process. But uh, they do have a lot of technology, uh, large liquid handling platforms, uh, notably TCAN in the UK, um, for handling the, uh, the RNA, purifying the RNA, and then setting up the qPCR. So, uh, and increasingly, we're seeing uh, 384 format uh, for very high throughput uh, assays. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is a few problems with the, the large uh, robotic uh, handling systems in that um, you know it's it's difficult to get uh, reliant and a consistent uh, petting of the buffers and the samples um, there's lots of viscous samples lots of viscous buffers as well um, it's also difficult um, using those large machines to switch between formats you know from the 96 to 384 plates for example uh, can be quite tricky uh, and then there's huge amounts of uh, disposable plastic wear uh, and we've seen certainly shortages of uh, much of this uh, you know plastic tips and automated tips in particular at the moment there's a shortage um, Kyogen for example ran out of uh, well they didn't run out but there were shortages of uh, Kyogen reagents and things like that so particularly under under uh, the conditions at the moment where we've got a very high through a high demand for assays so uh, the picture on the right here just shows a huge stack of TCAN tips, um, which, oops, which uh, you know are needed for there's 25,000 automated PCRs. So you do really need a lot of plastics. Uh, and when there's under pandemic conditions, there's obviously shortages and there's, there's bottlenecks in, in in supply. And there's all sorts of problems with feeding these, uh, you know, the very high amount of uh, reagents and uh, plastics that are required for high throughput testing. Uh, another problem is, uh, you know, uh, if you're using a large liquid handler, you know, it's quite difficult to miniaturize assays. Um, so, you know, if you're running out short on reagents, you know, you can't just lower the volumes very easily, you know, that can be quite difficult. And, you know, using all those tips, there's inevitably going to be a lot of dead volume and uh, you're going to lose a lot of reagent just uh, being stuck on the outside of the tip. So um, we have had uh, a Mantis system for um, over a year now and uh, we're a single cell facility. Uh, we don't do, um, or we didn't do uh, any RNA um, virus testing up until fairly recently. Um, but the problem that we had as a single cell lab is similar in that we had a lot of samples to process and we needed a um, method and a system of being able to reproducibly uh, process all those samples and, and run uh, PCRs simultaneously. So we had a very high throughput um, requirement. 
And the Mantis system um, was very attractive to us because um, firstly, it's very small, so it could go in, um, easily go into a clean room or a hood, a PCR hood, it's that small. Um, it, uh, it's very good at miniaturizing, so it can dispense right down to 100 nanoliters um, for hands flexibility to go up to, uh, even up to milliliters of liquid dispensing. Um, it doesn't use tips as well, um, which at the moment, because there are shortages of tip, tips, it is actually a big advantage. Um, instead, it uses a uh, microfluidic um, chip-like device, which um, gets picked up on an arm. By the, the Mantis has a small uh, arm which picks up the chips and then um, the microfluidic uh, chambers in the chip actually control the dispensing of the liquid. So it's a contactless dispenser and there's no, there's no tips and there's no, um, the only consumable is really the chip and the chips are uh, reusable. Um, it's very versatile in terms of the liquid formats. We've, um, we've only found one liquid which we're struggling with, which is very viscous. Uh, ligase, but things typically used for COVID testing, such as uh, acute PCR puffers, um, and things like that, are very easily perpetrated with, 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 the, with the Mantis. Um, it has a uh, capability of perpetuating up to six liquids at a time. Uh, we haven't seen any cross-contamination, even of single-cell samples, and we use a lot of um, NGS-style uh, barcoding, so we're really absolutely sure that there isn't any issues with cross-contamination. Uh, um, or any issues like that, and it's easy to clean. So this is our uh, automated uh, COVID workflow where we've integrated the, uh, the Mantis into the workflow. And um, to get the throughput, uh, we decided that probably a 384 plate format is probably the best. And we had uh, a Roche uh, light cycler with a 384 block capable of um, uh, measuring the, running the qPCR. Um, but there are two issues. First of all, we get the Mantis to dispense the qPCR buffers into the uh, 384 plate. And typically, we use the uh, CDC um, M1 and N2 uh, probes for COVID, um, which is applied by IDT. We just use them uh, as per IDT's uh, protocol. Um, <clears throat> the problem uh, is to get the RNA into the plate. So we have a variety of liquid handlers that can do that. Uh, the simplest um, is probably the Integra Viaflow, which has a 96 or 384 head uh, and is semi-automated uh, and can easily prepare um, into the 384 plates and just transfer the RNA into those plates. We also have a larger machine, the Beckman FXP, which is uh, just as capable. Um, we also have an SPT um, Mosquito robot, which is also capable of doing that. So though any of those three systems or any of the, you know, many other systems out there are probably capable of patting the RNA into the, uh, into the qPCR plate. We then run it on a, on a light cycler 482, and then we get our qPCR results. Um, so here's just a, a video of, uh, this is the, <clears throat> our Mantis in the clean room, which is uh, dispensing the qPCR buffer into a 384 format light cycle of plate. And if you notice, you can see the plate itself is actually sat on a cool rack XT. So we keep, these are sort of metal racks and we can just easily keep them in the freezer, keep, keep the reactions cold. And when they start to warm up, we just swap them. Um, so I'll just play this video. So you can see, hopefully you can see the drops uh, basically being spat out of the, uh, the nozzle of the microfluidic chip. And um, the clever thing about the Mantis is the, uh, the input, which is um, the reservoir. So it's quite different from other robots in that you can see here, there's actually a, a tip, um, which is actually acting as a reservoir. And that's a very, very clever innovation on the Mantis because effectively there's zero, um, there's almost zero uh, dead volume in the whole system is about four microliters in the chip itself. Um, so, you know, it really is very frugal with the, uh, with the buffers. Um, for us, you know, in NGS, we often use a very expensive buffer, so that was a big attraction. But um, if with, with the COVID situation, you know, uh, you know, even QPCR buffers are becoming fairly precious. So uh, that's a really nice um, 
innovation and, and you can actually just refill up this tip. Um, you can pause the robot and refill it. Uh, and if you've got really huge throughput, you can actually just run it off a, um, uh, a tube um, into a larger vessel. So you know, unlimited in terms of uh, volumes really. And um, it can do a qPCR 304 plate probably in around about four or five minutes. So if you have a whole series of these to do, um, you do have to do them one at a time uh, on the Mantis, um, but it really doesn't take very long. Certainly much, much quicker and, and easier than uh, manual pipetting. Here we have, um, this is our Integra um, Bioflow system for adding the RNA. So the RNA is in a, already in a 384 format. So if I play the video, so the robot just picks up the, uh, the RNA, simultaneously 384 wells, and then just then distributes that into the uh, qPCR plate. So that can be done very, very quickly. So a combination of these two systems is really, um, you can go very, very quick and um, set up a lot of plates in a very short amount of time. Um, so that's a very good combination. In terms of the assay that we use on the Mantis, uh, we, like I mentioned, we're just using the IDT supplied commercial assay, um, research use only or um, emergency use. Um, for our, and these are the CDC um, M1 and N2 fan probes. Uh, and there's also a control probe, which is a uh, human RNA, RNAs, P, I think it is. And uh, so typically they're being run as single plex assays. Um, and uh, we then, as I mentioned, the master, me master mix is either Takara One Step uh, RT or Promega GoTac. Um, both are pretty good. We, we think the Takara is probably a little bit better, although it is more expensive. And then we usually run them on the uh, Roosh Light Cycler. Uh, which also has an interchangeable block between 96 and 384, so you can change formats quite easily on that system. Uh, these are the actual first results I ever got from the uh, light cycler. So we just did, um, this is a standard curve of um, twist um, RNA COVID copies, uh, plasmid, uh, it's not plasmid, it's an RNA control, uh, I think from 10,000 to zero standard curve. Um, using the full volume of Promega, and we also tried halving the volume with the M1 and the N2 probes. And the results were pretty good. Uh, we were quite um, pleased with the results. We got PCR efficiencies in, in an acceptable range from the percent in one occasion. Um, a little bit of a drop when we halved the volume in efficiency, but nothing, nothing unacceptable. And it was de capable of detecting almost down to one copy, um, but that was obviously um, a little bit hit or miss as to whether it could do that, but it certainly could pick up 10 copies of RNA, COVID RNA. Um, <clears throat> so we were doing all this in collaboration with the, uh, our local um, clinical lab at the John Radcliffe Hospital, Microbiology Lab, um, and uh, they were kind enough, kind enough to pro provide us with some uh, nasal swabs, uh, well, nasal uh, RNA actually, which they had uh, purified using the um, Kaijin system. Uh, and this enabled us to validate our, uh, our automated workflow. And we found uh, testing 96 um, of these samples of known COVID or, or uh, positive and negatives. Uh, we found very high agreement and all the, neg all the negative controls were negative. So we were quite confident that uh, the Mantis workflow was working um, uh, acceptably. Um, at the time, we were asked to um, uh, try and multiplex some and, and reduce the volumes of the assays. So this is the um, this is a summary of the uh, the assay that we settled on, which is um, uh, a Takara mix. Um, although uh, you could also use Promega quite happily at half the volume, and we kept the input of RNA at five microliters because. Um, uh, we wanted to keep the um, sensitivity as, as close as possible to the full volume. Um, the other thing that we did was also um, multiplexed, um, we multiplexed the, the N2 probe for COVID with the human um, um, RNA, R RP, RP um, control. 
um, by basically labeling the RP probe with um, a Sci-5. Um, and then, so it's working as a FAM Sci-5 multiplex. Um, the M1 we kept as a, a single plex um, just for um, sensitivity. But um, so that was, the, that was the reaction we ran and it was about half the volume of, of the recommended volume from the manufacturer. And it seemed to be absolutely fine. Um, these are standard curves with the N2 um, probe multiplexed um, either on its own or uh, multiplexed with the Sci-5 RP. And we didn't notice any particular difference, no shifts in the uh, sensitivity of the assay. Um, in fact, uh, we actually managed to pick up one copy of RNA in the, in the multiplex, which we didn't, well, we did kind of in the, uh, in the single plex. So, um, yeah, we, we think that was, uh, those two combinations are very good um, multiplexing and reducing the volume. Um, really does help, you know, reduce costs and increase the throughput. So that's, uh, that's, that's the end of my uh, talk. So the conclusions are really uh, with the Mantis, uh, we can really get nice, consistent and reliable petting of the PCR buffers um, into plates, um, or oh, we can do tubes actually. Uh, we found that we can pet um, into Kaijin rotogene tubes um, very easily as well with the Mantis. So they're popular in uh, clinical labs. Um, we could uh, cool the reagents quite easily using simple kill plate holders, um, which are just passively frozen. Um, and, you know, it's very quick. It's easy to use. I mean, the Mantis in my facility is, is a multi-user instrument. And after about 20 or 30 minutes of uh, training, um, I'm very happy for people to come and use it themselves. Um, so it's a very simple machine easily adaptable to different assays and different volumes and different plates. Um, because we're a single cell facility, we were really hot on contamination and, and we have not seen any contamination, uh, even when we're using the chips, the disposable chips, um, between different liquid types. Um, so we're very confident that it's a nice, very clean, easy to use machine. The dead volumes are probably the lowest on the market of any liquid handler. Um, and this obviously, and the ability to such, uh, to reduce volumes is, is also important when you want to reduce costs and um, uh, reduce reliance on um, suppliers. Um, you know, we've got shorts, so it's really useful for that. And we found that multiplex in the N2 probe and the uh, human polymerase probe together, um, the CDC probes uh, seem to be absolutely fine. So that enables um, a higher throughput of assays to be done. Uh, so with that, I'll just um, finish. And uh, if anyone's got any questions, just um, let us know. I'll just finish on this uh, advert for my facility, which is we're based at, in Oxford in the UK. And we, uh, we have a dedicated single cell genomics facility. Um, but we are open for um, projects from anywhere. Um, internationally or in the UK. Uh, we have Chromium from 10X, we have BD Rhapsody, and we do various plate-based assays. We also have fluid arm equipment. We do sequencing, we do library preparation. Uh, we do all these as a service. Um, you just send us samples or we can provide training for virtually, uh, well, most uh, single cell techniques. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, and I do already see a lot of questions coming in. And if you do have any questions, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, please feel free to add them to the Q&A section here on Zoom. If you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a button that says Q&A and it has two little speech bubbles. And if you click that, you'll be able to submit questions. And let's just get started with that first question. Um, Magda is asking um, if you do supply it with the different master mixes that already include the primers. Um, yeah, so I, I will, uh, I'll answer that one. Um, we are, Formulatrix are, in, are an instrument uh, manufacturer. So we personally don't provide any, uh, any master mixes, any reagents at all. So 
the great thing about that is that you're free to use whichever uh, master mix and primer uh, combinations that you wish to. And, and as I think Neil mentioned, um, Demantis has been used with a, a broad range of different manufacturers' uh, reagents with great success. Yeah, I'll just add that we've only come across one liquid type, which we're hopefully going to sort, which is a very viscous lyase, um, which we can't, well, even that we can prepare. So um, I'm very confident we can prepare very viscous liquids and um, particularly any, any qPCR buffer would be very easy, easily prepared with the mantis. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And then the next question is actually about how a viscose of a solution you can dispense with these systems. Do you have any very accurate um, information on that? Yeah, sure. So um, as, as Neil said, um, it will work with a, a really broad range of, uh, of liquids. Um, the Mantis can handle up to around about 60% glycerol. Um, one of the really nice things about the Mantis is that because it uses positive displacement technology, um, there's no need for any calibration. So whether you're dispensing aqueous reagents or something more viscous, you can be reassured that you're going to get a good uh, reproducible dispense, um, even up at those uh, very high viscosity levels. Great. And then the next question, um, somebody's asking in which order you add it. So do you add the sample and then the master mix or do you add the master mix and then the sample? Um, well, for various reasons, it's, it's usually easier to prepare the master mix and then add the, add the RNA into that. So that's, that's the usual way we do it. Great. Sounds good. Um, and then the next question is if you can chill the reagents and plate during dispense. Um, yes, you can do that. The, the mantis is actually small enough that if, if your reagents were really temperature sensitive, um, you could actually locate the mantis in, inside a, a small fridge. Um, we've, not, we've found that we don't really need to do anything like that. Um, so we just, uh, none, of, none of the things that we've prepared, which are just things like NGS um, type enzymes and qPCR buffers, they're usually pretty stable at, even at room temperature for a long time. Um, so we find that the period of time that it's on in the reservoir uh, on the dispenser chip, uh, it will warm up a little bit then, but um, we've not noticed any, any particular problems with, with that. But if it was a really sensitive, um, temperature sen sensitive, um, Buffer, then yes, you could operate it probably quite happily in, inside a, a chilled cabinet. And that's right, Dan. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So we have people that are uh, that are doing work with um, 3D cell culture, so spheroids and organoids, and um, working with um, uh, extracellular matrices that need to be kept uh, very, very cold. And those people are running the mantis inside a uh, inside a small compact fridge. Uh, the other thing um, with to do with uh, with sort of chilling reagents, if you don't need to go to those sorts of extremes, um, you can easily have the reagents uh, just sitting on ice. And I think you use the uh, the cold block to keep the plates themselves cold, which is great for helping prevent evaporation during the dispensing. Great. And then um, Kel is asking if you have any thoughts on sample pooling. Well, it's a good idea. I think um, uh, if you want to increase throughput, but um, it's got to be obviously it's got to be done very carefully. Um, and I think uh, most um, most labs would probably struggle to. Uh, Keep track of the samples in in such a sophisticated way really so I, yeah i mean it's a good idea but um probably i think probably if you were going to do sample pooling uh probably an ngs type uh, method would be better where you barcode everything and then do the assay but um yeah it's a good idea and if, if we want to do a lot of samples in in maybe uh you know asymptomatic, asymptomatic uh, patients that might be might be uh useful in some circumstances 
Right. Um, and then Jack is asking if you find, if you, if you did find any problems with contamination early on, um, and what kind of precautions did you take um, for to prevent contamination? Um, well, like I say, we, we routed them out. Our normal job is actually a single cell, and they're really, really easy to contaminate. Um, so we have two mantises, mant no, no, um, one in the clean room and one in the post PCR area, and we so most of the pre-PCRs we do in the clean room, Mantis, and we've not seen any contamination, RNAs contamination, anything like that. Um, the only issue that we had with the COVID testing was uh, actually contamination of the probes and the primer, primers themselves during the manufacture. And we, we had a lot of problems um, with particularly the M1 uh, contamination uh, because the, uh, during the synthesis, the primers and the probes, there's residual um, DNA from previous uh, reactions in the machines and, and they can actually carry through into your, um, your, uh, your particular primer set. And we did have a lot of problems uh, with the, this, that particular type of, of contamination. Um, and it was so low that it only really cropped up when we did a lot of samples. Um, so, you know, if you did small batches just to test the probes, we're okay. You might not see it, but when you started to do throughput uh, plate testing, then you, you suddenly get these uh, um, false positives cropping up. And um, that completely went away when we changed the, the primer sets. Um, we found that the IDT supplied uh, COVID primer sets were always absolutely fine, but we did see this problem with contamination with all the manufacturers. So I would recommend uh, sticking to IDT if possible. For the, this, these kind of assays. Great. And then um, Magda and Pat both have similar questions. So Magda is asking how many times a chip can be reused. So if you could share the cost of them. And also Pat is asking um, how often do you switch out for a fresh chip? Um, well, done. We'll probably uh, know the you know, the number of uses of a chip. I think it's been, um, I think it dispensed drops millions of times um, before it needs to be replaced. Um, we've been using ours um, for certain applications for um, nearly a year, and we haven't noticed any particular problem with it. Um, we do wash the chips out, and we tend to use one chip per fluid type. Um, um, for the COVID testing, I would use one chip per reaction buffer or one probe. So, that, you know, there's, there's not, there's virtually no uh, chance of um, cross contamination. But um, yeah, during the runs themselves, I never, I never, unless it was a different liquid, um, a different master mix, I, would, I wouldn't change the chip. You just keep the chip and just um, use it until you've finished um, however many plates you need to sell. Yeah, um, Neil's right in, in, on the uh, the millions of dispensers. So we've tested the uh, tested the Mantis chips to uh, a million dispensers without showing any drop off in performance. And uh, the latest uh, generation of of the Mantis has um, RFID tracking embedded in the chip. So um, with just a, a click of the mouse, you can see exactly how old that chip is, uh, how many times it's been used, and um, that helps you to plan for, uh, for, for replacing those chips um, when they do come to the end of, their, uh, end of their life. Great, and um, somebody else is asking if you have to change the liquid setting between master mixes. Um. No, and in fact, uh, we were just using the, uh, the water, the default water um, liquid class, um, and we didn't notice any, any particular problem. Um, so, no, I think QPCR buffer is fairly easy to prepare. Okay, great. Um, and then another question is, if you use the Mantis to dispense um, Beads. Sorry, was that beads? I think it says beads, yeah. Yep, beads. 
beads. Um, oh, right. Uh, this might be something to do with the uh, bead, beads for cleanup, PCR beads. Um, which, yes, we actually have done that. <laughs> so that, that does work on the Mantis, yeah. If that's, if that's the mean, there's, there's a lot of different kind of beads, but I assume that's, that's what they mean. Okay. If we didn't answer the question, feel free, whoever asked it, I don't see who would ask it, but feel free to add more detail. Um, okay. And another question is, what sort of dead volume does the Mantis need? Uh, the dev volume is is really if you use a tip as a reservoir, um, I think the dead volume inside the chip is four microliters. But even that volume, you can actually recover, so you can actually back um, flush the chip. So if there's any liquid in it, you can actually recover it if you need to. Um, but the dead volume is is probably the lowest of any system um, that I've got, and I've got a few few different robots, but it, it is very very low. So it's, it's fantastic for, for that. I think the dead volume would go up if you were using large volume reservoirs. So these would have tubing that, that would uh, go into a larger reservoir, such as a Falcon tube um, for larger volumes. You would, you would definitely get more uh, dead volume in that situation. But um, for, um, we, we've, we set up lots of plates um, with just the tip as a reservoir and we find we can just top up the tip and that's, that's absolutely fine. And we've even um, we've even tried putting on a five mil tip, which is a huge tip, as a reservoir, and it seems to be able to. I mean, there is a limit uh, to how big the reservoir on the Mantis uh, arm, because the Mantis arm is not that strong, but um, it does seem to be able to hold about five milliliters of liquid, and that's more than enough to uh, set up a few few PCR plates at a time. That's one of the things that I really like about the Mantis is the fact that people find ways to uh, to push the limits of what it's capable of doing. And um, just to sort of comment on the on the larger reservoir. So rather than using a pipette tip, you can use some tubing to um, draw your reagent from an Eppendorf tube or a Falcon tube. Um, and there, um, the uh, the excess in that tubing needs to be around about 250 microliters, but that can all be returned back to the reagent reservoir afterwards. So again, you're not wasting any of that reagent, which can be quite difficult to get hold of at the moment. Okay, great. Um, and then somebody, um, Pedro, is actually asking how customizable the protocols are for these systems and he's asking if you can set it to dispense uh, variable volumes of multiple liquids over a plate um, for reaction optimization. Is that something that's possible? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, with, the, uh, with the Mantis you have the capability to dispense any volume of any reagent into any well. Um, there are tools built into the software that can help you create gradients um, so you can have sort of uh, multiple different combinations of, uh, of reagents. Um, and you can also work with um, a design of experiment software. So if you have something that's um, defined in your uh, DOE software, you can bring that into the Mantis software with a couple of clicks and run your experiment that way. So we've tried to make it as flexible as possible. Um, for that kind of optimization work. Yeah, and I, I've used, um, I've set up quite a lot of assays which have gone from 100 nanoliters up to um, 200 microliters. Um, and the amount is really easy to, to uh, set up on those ranges. So um, yes, it's, it's, it's completely, it's really nice machine for, um, adapting assays and uh, that's a lot of what we've done is reducing uh, things down to take advantage of the nanoliter dispensing so um, NGS um, library preps for example we've reduced them to very very low volumes and uh, results are generally comparable to um, the, the normal standard size volumes so um, it's really easy to uh, adapt protocols to almost any volume really Okay, great. Um, let's do a couple more questions. There are a lot of questions coming in, um, but Lauren is asking if titration is feasible with the Mantis for primers um, or probes screening, for instance. 
Um, yeah, so I, mean, I, th I think that, that kind of um, falls under the same same sort of category as, as, as the previous question. So looking at different, uh, different concentrations of, of primers and probes, you can set that up really simply on the Mantis. Um, so um, one of the typical things that, that people are doing is sort of dispensing in quadrants maybe, and then having a, a different primer probe combination in, in, the, uh, in the four quadrants on a plate. Okay, great. And then um, Stefan is asking, how do you normalize your RNA samples? Uh, yeah, the, well, the, if he's, he's talking about um, COVID testing, then you can't really do that because the amount of RNA is, is vanishingly low from a, from a swab. Um, so, and it's not, it's not really necessary for a COVID test because you really just want to almost like a binary question do you want to know you want to know whether it's there or not um so um yeah i mean generally if if you're doing a normal rna workflow maybe not on a covid sample then you know um you can use any old kit really for that but the covid testing you don't really need to normalize it okay um yeah so just to just to kind of um uh, follow on from that the uh, the Mantis does have uh, the capability for uh, normalization. So if you're doing a um, um, a process that requires your inputs to to be normalized, uh, then you can take your data straight from your uh, straight from your plate reader, so uh, qubits or something like that. Import that into the Mantis, and the Mantis can carry out that normalization by adding uh, diluent to uh, a fixed volume of uh, of sample in each well um in uh, a couple of minutes so a uh, really um slick way of of doing that normalization which can take a long time to do by hand if you're adding uh, 96 or 384 different volumes of re of, uh, of a diluent into uh, into a plate great thank you um and we're almost up on time but i think we have time for one more question um and adam is asking at the volumes that you're using, how many times do you have to refill the tip being used as a reservoir? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think we can get one and a half um, plates out of uh, one mil. Um, um, but, but, but we can actually put quite a lot of extra than one mil in, into a tip. So yeah, it, it's not very often. Okay, great. And that's it for time. Um, but Neil and Dan, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. And Dan, maybe you want to quickly just mention how, because there were a lot of other questions, how can um, people get in touch with you if they have any additional questions? Um, yeah, so I can see that there's, there's there's loads of questions and quite a few that we haven't had the ability to uh, to um, to respond to. So um, the best way to get in touch with us is um, through email, and you can uh, you can contact me. My email address is uh, dan .lord at formulatrix.com. Great, thank you so much. And as I mentioned, we have recorded this webinar, and the recording will be shared. Um, shortly afterwards sometime today and yeah thank you all for listening in today and thank you neil and dan again for joining us thank you anita and thanks thanks again to everyone who's attended and thanks for some fantastic questions it was great to see so much uh, so much interest and so much engagement and uh, and thank you very much neil for uh, for a really great uh, presentation there yeah thanks have a great day everyone thanks very much Thank you.